but to really, we're here being very transparent to say, we're joined with the Holy Spirit in calling forth an experience of glee and joy and happiness that, that you are entitled to, that you deserve, that we all deserve, and, and to do it in the most practical way possible. So I thought what we would do is, um, is open the floor up for everything, and then around four o'clock if somebody has a watch and they're looking at it, <laughs> uh, you can let us know. We'll take a little break with uh, refreshments, and then we'll come back for more time. Um, an important question that I've been looking at is, if it's so that the, the truth is that we are one in God right now this very second, and that we never left the Godhead, and that perhaps there was a wrinkle in time or a split second where we consider separation to feel what it would be feeling like to be <clears throat> separate from all beingness, and we did that adventure, I'm wondering who made that decision, and if it really ever <laughs> happened, or if there is no wrinkle in time, and that we are right now sitting in the unified field of being our total divinity, and why are we having this ridiculous movie reel playing where we're happy some of the time and we're sad some of the time and we're in joy and we're caught up in death of loved ones and we're on a journey that's sometimes easy and sometimes difficult. What is this odd movie reel that's going on if the truth is we are connected to being God at all moments? Yes. Yeah, you've, you've asked, in my travels for the last 18 years, I get many, many questions, and I call that the number one question. Um, I've heard that asked in, in many different languages, in many different countries. I've been in 22 countries, and, and I would say that's like the basic, I call that the number one question. And variations of it is when you say, who was that being that made that decision? Uh, that's one version of it. How could this even happen in the first place? If everything is one and everything is perfect, how could this uh, dream or any uh, concept of separateness, or like you said, happy day, sad day, uh, the duality of, of joy and love and happiness and peace and freedom and guilt, pain, shame, envy and anxiety, how could that ever occur? And actually, as A Course in Miracles was being scribed, taken down, from Jesus, uh, that was the first question that the scribes asked, uh, the scribe and the scribe's partner, uh, who was, they were taking it down, Bill Thetford and Helen Shuckman. After so many chapters, they were kind of like, Jesus, before we go on with your book, we just have one question. How could this happen in the first place? I mean, they've done enough chapters of some of the ideas I'm sharing, and they just asked that question, and Jesus said, well, it's a good question, and this is the way that he addressed it. This is the way Jesus Christ addressed your question to them, which is really to everyone, to all of us. He said, he said, you can tell by your daily emotions, almost roller coaster ride of emotions, that you believe that the separation happened. You believe it. In reality, it did not. It's like the Christ speaking from the oneness, and he's saying, I am giving you this book, I am giving you this course, these exercises, I'm giving you this practice as a means of realizing the state of mind that I am in. Uh, and all his first answer was, you can tell by your emotional roller coaster ride that you believe in it. Very much like in this world, we talk about Pygmalion. We talk about self-fulfilling prophecies. You know, how, how powerful the mind is. That if somebody can believe they're, they're limited, weak, frail, and so forth, then it does seem to be a self-fulfilling prophecy in their awareness. Not in reality, but just in awareness, it seems that way. So then, there's a part in the Course too where it's it's called the clarification of terms. Initially, when it came through, it was at the very beginning, but it got put at the end, when you have the published version. You have to go to the back of the book, 
course, I went right to the clarification of terms at the beginning. Said, What's this? Clarification of terms? I'm not reading this book until I find out what the terms mean. But anyway, I went back there and he said, he said, an experience will come that will end your doubting. And he said, an experience. In other words, he, he, he was saying at the end, he said, it's not going to be a theology that will come, that will end your doubting. And we certainly have a lot of theologies in this world. And he wasn't saying that there's a conceptual belief system that will come, that will end your doubting. He's saying there's an actual experience. And it, it kind of reminds me of like, when I was in psychology, I would read all about Freud and B.F. Skinner and all the different theories, you know, the, the Neo-Freudians and on and on. And I, I remember reading Abraham Maslow's stuff, where he had hierarchy of needs. And it reminded me a little bit of when Darlene was talking today, where she was talking about survival. Survival is down at the bottom of the hierarchy of needs. You know, you need, you know, you need to feed the body, you need to clothing, shelter, survival mechanisms is there. And then when you work your way up, you work your way up to higher orders of needs, including his pinnacle, at the very top of his triangle, was self-actualization. Being needs, he called them. Just, just to know what you were saying, to know that you, you are. It's simply, you, you exist as a pure being. And so I thought, well, that's a pretty good system. When I was in psychology, I thought, that sounds somewhat reasonable, but we have to work our way through levels of needs. And that's really what, what uh, Jesus is saying with this course. He's saying, in reality, you're at home in heaven, dreaming of exile. Just like when we go to sleep at night and you have a dream, the dream can seem very real. It's like, you know, you're, it's like you can have a lot of emotional reactions. If there's a monster chasing you, if you fall off a cliff and are plummeting down into the valley, or falling from an airplane or whatever, you know, those emotions can seem very real. Even with children, when they have a, if they're being chased by a monster, it could be like, you know, the heart, heart is pounding because it seems very real. And now we have a branch in psychology, we could say in transpersonal psychology, we have a branch called lucid dreaming, where it's basically teaching that you can be aware of your dreams. You can be actually aware that's your dreaming. And it's a very empowered state of mind. Uh, imagine that you're aware that you're dreaming and a monster comes up. It's a, it's a big difference from being aware that you're dreaming the monster and that it's just a dream and feeling like you're a figure in the dream that's now facing a dragon or a monster. It can be quite terrifying in that position, of, that you're just a figure, you're a person, and there's a monster in front of you. So, so basically, the answer to your question is, in reality, a, it is a fact that our <coughs> essence and our being is one with God, and has never left, and that there is no such thing as a separation or a fall from grace, that that is impossible. And what this is called in the Course of Miracles, in the, the path that I used, in my own awakening to the lucid dream or to the happy dream, this is called <laughs> atonement. And it sounds like a very Christian word, you know, there's a lot of things associated with atonement, like you have to pay something, like Jesus was here to atone for the sins of men, and you know, like a sacrifice or whatever. But actually what atonement means, is it means correction. That that this silly tiny man idea was just an error and that it has been corrected and that our one responsibility is to accept the correction. 